Okay, I guess we can go ahead and get started now to let everyone know uh, there is live captioning available for this event. So there is some information in the chat about how to access those, um, those captions. So you can view the captions by clicking on uh, the caption button and choosing to show subtitles or there's a link in the chat if you wanna view those captions separately in your browser. So welcome everyone to our Global Accessibility Awareness Fair for 2021. I am Jim Dandel, Web Manager at the Library, here with Jimmy Kong, Disability Specialist at the Office of Students with Disabilities, and we'll be introducing ourselves more shortly. So just real quickly, for our agenda for the day, we're gonna start with a land acknowledgement. We're gonna introduce ourselves and the session and while we're here, We'll go through, um, we'll have a no mouse challenge. Then after the no mouse challenge, we will do a screen reader demonstration. And then following the screen reader demonstration, we'll actually have some practice with describing images that everyone can participate in. So starting with our land acknowledgement, the UC San Diego community holds great respect for the land and the original people of the area where our campus is located. The university is built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation. Today, the Kumeyaay Nation people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. So as I mentioned, I'm Jen Dandel. I'm the web manager here at the library and I'm also the chair of the UC San Diego Electronic Accessibility Oversight Committee. I have a background in web development and um, one of my passions is in web accessibility and helping others make the web better for all. And I'm gonna pass it over to Jimmy for him to introduce about himself. Thanks, Jen. Um, Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jimmy Kong. I am a disability specialist at the Office for Students with Disabilities. So some of my duties uh, include uh, meeting with students to provide accommodations based on their current functional limitations. I also test accessibility both around the campus and uh, electronically, so electronic accessibility. Um, I am an alumni, so I graduated from uh, UC San Diego in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in music and visual arts media. And above all, I am legally blind. So I use assistive technology uh, every day of my life and I am so proud to be here and I'm so glad to be a part of this and bring awareness to the importance of accessibility. So I would like to pass it back to Jen to get started with the No Mouse Challenge. If, uh, Jen, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Jimmy. Um, so we're gonna get started now with the No Mouse Challenge. Uh, so I just wanna take a second to describe a little bit about that. So the No Mouse Challenge is basically um, a little practice of using the web without using your mouse. So this might be unfamiliar to some of you who are used to using a mouse to get around a keyboard. Others of you might be more familiar with using um, keyboard shortcuts and things like that. So I'll have some information that I'll show on the next slide and read for you all um, to help you navigate. So the idea of this is to um, just come out of the full screen of your Zoom window and actually load a browser on your computer and try this out um, as we're going along. And I invite you to share your reactions or questions or thoughts in the chat. If you wanna share that with the um, panelists, then um, I will also be sharing some of the reactions that we get in the chat with the larger group um, so that we can kind of make this more of an engaging kind of conversation piece than just you're sitting here listening to us talk about what you should do. So without further ado, um, here are some tips for using the keyboard to access web pages. And I will leave this uh, screen up as we go through this exercise so that you can refer back to it to um, see what you need um, to navigate the, the site or the page that you're on. So the first tip is um, when you first load the browser, you can, you can press Control L or Command L on a Mac 
to get to the address bar. <clears throat> then just type your address and hit enter. Once you're on a web page, you can press tab to move to the next link, form, element, or button. You can press shift tab if you want to move backwards and go to the previous link, form, element, or button. If you want to interact with an element, you can press enter or spacebar to activate the current link or button. You can also use the arrow keys escape or other keys if doing so would seem to make sense. So I'm gonna leave this screen up and just come out of this presenter mode um, so that I can be aware of the chat and I invite you all to practice alone along in your, in your browser. Oh, I have a comment from our, a participant that says they can't even get back out of the address bar on a Mac. Um, I think that if you put something in there and you hit enter, it should load the page and take you out of the address bar. You may try pressing tab to also get around. Sometimes tab will take you through elements on the browser window itself and not necessarily the page in the browser. Excuse me. Another thing to actually try is possibly uh, hitting escape on your keyboard. That's always a safe haven for a lot of things. Um, Usually, when you start typing something, it tries to autofill, and that's when uh, you might not be able to get out of it, but definitely hit escape a couple times. We have a comment here. What an interesting challenge. I am navigating the UCSD Blink site, and notice it takes a great many number of times pressing tab. It takes you through many uh, elements of the drop down menus. That is great feedback. We'll see later in the presentation how some of the things that you all will see now when you're working through with the keyboard pressing tab, how those things will actually play out for a screen reader user as well. Someone else says, I'm learning new shortcuts on the keyboard that I never knew. I'm a little clunky because I'm not familiar with them. It takes a lot of tabs to get to the link you want. Someone else says, I am trying to play Google's tic-tac-toe and it is very frustrating. Someone else says, I'm navigating a long page with a lot of links and it takes so long to tab to the element I want to go to. Looks like we have a great conversation starters going already. Someone else says, I accidentally pressed a random key and a little shortcut prompt box popped up and it suggests I type backslash to go back to the search bar. Cool. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I would be curious about what key you hit. These are amazing. Uh, I know. I love doing this exercise. It's really great um, to, to get some of the, the reactions from folks who are new to this kind of exercise. Um, so um, on ucsd.edu, I'm trying to 
use the space bar to activate the current button and it doesn't work. No. Um, oh, someone is asking a great question and I'm actually not sure of the answer, but I wonder if, if Jimmy might know this. So someone asks, how, how can I do actions that I normally do from a right click on the mouse? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, so um, let's see. Yeah, I'm pretty, okay. So on Windows, there might be a context menu button somewhere on your keyboard. It's different with any every manufacturer. So therefore you don't know where the context menu button is. Sometimes on full size keyboards, there's actually one, I think by um, the six buttons right above the arrow key. Um, there might be a context menu there, um, not completely sure. But on Mac, the command shortcut, and this is a handful, is command, option, shift, M, as in menu. And that usually, uh, for at least for a screen reader, that pulls it up but I'm not completely sure if that pulls it up on uh, when you don't have a screen reader activated. All right, I just put that little tip to the panelists and the attendees in the chat. That's command option shift M on a Mac. Going back to some of these comments now, someone says opening a new tab is eluding me. Oh, that's a great shortcut that we can add to our list for next time. If you do control T or control or command T, if you're on a Mac, that should open a new tab. Someone else says, when I tab around on UCSD sites, it only goes between the search field and not all of the links. Google works as expected though. Looks like we have a mix of Mac and Windows users. This is cool. Mm -hmm. Someone says it took a while to figure out how to go back to the previous page I was on and it's frustrating how unintuitive it is. This is great, great feedback. Yeah, yeah, it's so interesting because on Windows, it's uh, when you, I think if you hit control left arrow, I think that goes back. Uh, and then on Mac, it's command, whatever the bracket, like the left bracket and the right bracket keys, I think those is uh, those are what it uh, brings you back a page. It's the weirdest. So someone else was that, yeah, someone just asked that question, like how do I go back to the previous page after pressing enter on a button? So yeah, it's, it's super interesting because, you know, sometimes you can, Sometimes the delete key will even take you back. Um, but I think those vary by, by operating system. But these are really great questions about additional um, shortcut keys. So I appreciate having these so we can make our documentation even richer for the next time that we do this exercise. Someone says, yikes, my fingers are getting cramps, right? <laughs> when we right. take the weight off one part and we put it all on another, it starts to make a big difference in our experience. Oh, here's a good question. How can I navigate from tab to tab on a Mac? I would actually really like to know that myself. There is a keyboard shortcut for it. I have accidentally activated it. I just don't know what it is because I always do it by accident. So it's control tab on both Mac and Windows. Okay, cool. I'm gonna put that one in the chat too. Yeah, and if you have it opened in a new window, because I understand that a new window is different than a tab, the command on Mac is command grov. It's the button right next to the number one on your keyboard and right above the tab key. So that's how you switch to different windows on the Mac. Okay, I am Switching back to check out some more of the comments and share those. Let's see where I'm scrolling back up. Okay. On my Windows keyboard, oh, cool. So someone is sharing that on their Windows keyboard, the context menu key is marked by a square with three lines on it. So this person actually Google imaged it. So that's great. 
I'm trying to get to my Canvas page and made it to the Duo page, but I can't seem to figure out how to get it to the send me a push or call me button. Mm -hmm. Messing around on other sites, I have better look moving around. So Jimmy, I hear Jimmy giggling because I'm sure Jimmy has to deal with this on a regular basis. So do you have anything to share about that, Jimmy? Um, <laughs> I, I, I have to say like, um, the reason why the dual page doesn't work the way that it's supposed to with keyboard navigation is because where you push for a dual or if you want it to call you, that is actually an iframe. So it's not even in the actual interface of the website, it's actually embedded. So therefore there's issues there, even with a screen reader. So you're not alone. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to point that out. Yeah, that's a great point. And we, we can show more of that later too. So it's just something to think about when you're developing your pages, like there, there is an extra step for some people if you're embedding things using iframes. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't use iframes. It just means we have to think about how we do that. Oh, someone else says, me too, on Safari, jumping between the search bar and the address bar, but none of the actual clickable content on the site. Really frustrating. Oh, we have a great question here. Do programmers have to do something special to build in these keyboard shortcuts make their, or make their websites respond to keyboard shortcuts? Um, I'm wondering from the development process is if there's extra work put into that. So. Mm, that's a tricky thing to answer. I think that um, there are certain ways that you can code things that make them less accessible to the keyboard. Um, and it's being aware of what those things are. I wouldn't say that it necessarily takes um, extra work to make things keyboard accessible if you, if you have that understanding that certain things are going to impede that and you can uh, try to avoid that. Um, oh, someone else shared that um, if you have a number of tabs open, you can do command plus the number of the tab and go straight to that to switch tabs. Oh, we're getting great feedback on this, yeah, on great. this changing tab things. I love it. Me too. Another um, thing that I usually always mention to people who are developing apps or developing uh, like software is to keep accessibility in mind from the get-go because it's so much easier to code with accessibility in mind from the, uh, from the beginning than to retrofit your actual app with uh, accessibility. Um, there's a lot of documentation out there for uh, web apps and applications in general. Um, I'm pretty sure Oracle, uh, you know, for Java, they have a lot of documentation there. Um, Apple has a lot of that documentation if you want to create a Swift app. Um, there's definitely some stuff that to look into, but usually what the what I usually suggest to app developers is try to keep it as simple as possible because it doesn't just benefit people with disabilities, it benefits people who might not be familiar with a, uh, a touchscreen or a phone. Yeah, from the developer perspective also, um, you know, when we're talking about developers and development, one way um, to, to get a great start on making sure um, that, your, that your site is accessible is to make sure your code validates. And it seems really simple, um, almost too simple, but it's very hard to be accessible without valid code. Someone says, I would love to hear about what UCSD tools and websites you have found to be really hard to use that this way. So I think that Blink is a great example of a site that is very challenge, challenging to use when navigating with the keyboard only. Um, we saw that feedback from someone else on the call. And I know I've heard that from Jimmy. Jimmy, do you have any other other things that you would say are particularly challenging to navigate? 
Um, because I was a student, I also got to navigate a lot of student interfaces and I always get to check them now. So I think the one of the ones that really comes to mind right now is the HDH menus. Uh, when you want to look at like a, uh, like a dining menu, um, those uh, could definitely be improved uh, because those are really, really difficult to navigate. Um, another uh, common one that's actually kind of hard to navigate is the main UCSD website, UCSD.edu. And we're trying to actually see if we can um, fix some of those issues, um, trying to uh, be in contact with the developers and uh, provide them feedback. So there's a lot of websites around um, that might have these issues. Another good one is um, UCSDtritons.com. That's another one that I would like to work on in the future. Um, and we're also working on one for the UCSD bookstore. We're um, trying to get that website to be more accessible as well. So there's a lot of websites around the campus that might not be aware of how to actually um, bring these um, accessibility tools to their website. But however, that's why we're here. We want to bring awareness to this information. And if you have any further questions, you can always reach out to us and stuff like that. So I wanted to let you all have a little bit of experience in doing this no mouse challenge and navigating without a mouse. Um, to, before I sort of told you like what the purpose of it is. So um, one purpose behind um, navigating the page without a mouse is as you all noticed when you were trying this for yourselves, um, it's a great way to quickly identify the potential access issues who, that someone using assistive technology might use. So even if you're working on a website or you're a developer or you're just curious, um, you don't have to be um, an expert in anything to kind of have an idea about um, where things might go awry just by trying out this no mouse challenge and um, seeing what you get. Um, the other, um, so sometimes even if I'm just looking at something and I'm curious, I'll just try to navigate it with the keyboard and see what I get. And um, so for example, we had an interface we were working on in the library and I'm not super experienced in using a keyboard uh, to navigate so that, presents its own set of trickiness. And so I had trouble navigating with the keyboard and I immediately went to Jimmy and says, said, I basically said, can you, can you help me test this? Because I am concerned because usually if there's a keyboard navigation issue, there's a, probably another underlying issue. Um, in, the, in the case of the example I'm giving, it was actually probably like my ineptitude with the keyboard more than it was the interface because the interface was actually fine. Someone says Blink has a lot of items in the menu. Do you have an example of a similar website that has better accessibility? So some of the, um, we actually talked about this the other day with a group, didn't we, Jimmy? So some of the other CMS sites that are on the version five templates, their um, top menu um, is easier to navigate because it's not made out as a mega menu where it's just reading a long list of links. So on the, those CMS sites, it actually allows you to expand the single menu and go through those items. And so you, the user will get more of the categorization um, that you would want if you were kind of scrolling or browsing a menu. Um, Jimmy, do you have other examples of something where, where it's a really good experience to navigate with a keyboard? I think you covered it. Um, a lot of CMS5 templates are easier to navigate. Uh, when, when it comes to CMS templates, definitely there's more improvement to be done, but however, they're way much better than when I when CMS the CMS five templates got originally released. Originally, uh, when they were released, those menus would actually not stay open, so you cannot get access to those menus. But now, since those menus stay open, I can go down with a keyboard, uh, and the reason that is the case is because 
hover menus are always a cause of that. And screen readers don't hover. Screen readers um, have to be, have the ability to actually keep that menu open. So that's what the cause is. But however, I think Jen, you covered it pretty well. Great, thanks, Jimmy. Um, someone says the mobile navigation version of Blink is way easier to navigate. Oh, well, that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Someone else says the library is really lucky because we have a great IT team who can answer all of our questions about website accessibility and help us make our library sites more accessible. Who or what department would another UCSD employee, student, or faculty go for help in adapting their own site? I love this question, and we're going to share this at the end, but I'm going to put a link for uh, you all in the chat. So we recently launched a new site, it's accessibility.ucsd.edu. And so this has a little bit about the Electronic Accessibility Oversight Committee, including the membership list. So you can reach out to any one of us uh, for support. And there are also uh, several resources there which um, can help you to be more accessible as you're working through your content. Um, but yeah, we, we've definitely started doing more work with different groups on campus to actually help them evaluate and, and improve their systems. And we're kind of just leveraging the collective experience of the members on the committee to do that at this time. So um, that will be a resource that folks can use um, to, <clears throat> to, make their, um, to make their sites a little better. So I'm going to switch to the next slide really quick. and. Um, so we talked about kind of some of these things came up, but I want to um, explicitly ask these questions. And this kind of gets at the, you know, why it's useful to do this sort of thing. So thinking about, um, you know, could you access all of the features? It sounds like a great many of you could not access all the features for one reason or another. You, you got stuck between um, rotating between two elements or you tried to interact with something and it didn't actually do anything. So um, could you operate all, all the buttons for their controls? So it sounds like not always. So if you're frustrated with the experience using a keyboard navigation, then odds are somebody else who might have to only use the keyboard because maybe they broke their hand or they're holding a baby or um, any number of reasons that aren't necessarily related to ability status, um, it could be really frustrating. And the other thing um, to think about as we were doing this is how easy was it for you to tell where you were on the page? Did you get a marker that showed you what was selected as you were tabbing through things or was it kind of guesswork about where you were? So all of these things are kind of things to think about if you are like using this method to sort of evaluate something. Someone else says, the hardest thing I found was trying to keep up with where I was on the page using tabs. Yes, that is very difficult. If you don't, got, if you don't have some kind of marker to show you what's highlighted, it is very hard to tell where you are. Someone else says, inconsistent markings. Sometimes it was highlighted and sometimes it wasn't visible. Yep, that's an issue too. <clears throat> I think by default, usually things will be highlighted as you move to them. So typically you would see some issues with those markings not being there as usually related to the, um, the cascading style sheets, the CSS, the styles that are being applied to the site. So some of that, you know, we wanna make it look really good, but when we, when we make it look too good, we might present some usability issues as we are doing that. Oh, okay. So my link that I put in chat uh, didn't work. I'm going to redo that in a few minutes. Um, I think I probably added an extra letter, but it is a c c e s s i b i l i t y at dot u c s d dot edu, and that'll get you to the site. <clears throat> so at this point now, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to pass it over to Jimmy. And he is going to proceed with a screen reader demonstration. OK, yeah. it's all ready for you to share now. So the volume might go up a little bit. He's going to share his um, system sound through Zoom. So you may want to adjust your volume after that starts, because it will be a little bit louder than the spoken voice. Yeah, <clears throat> and I will make sure to pause between 
when my screen reader is actually reading. So, um, so here we go. Let's see here. Let me just make sure that everything looks good. Okay, cool. Okay, so. Okay, so here we go. You have started with screen share. Closed captioning has been enabled. Five dot cut pro. Five dot cut pro. Five dot cut pro. Window. Project time. Okay, so the first actual example that we're going to be, well, to kind of preface this, we will be uh, talking about three distinct parts of this. So we're going to first go through an application. Then we're going to go through two websites. So you kind of get a sense of how the screen reader navigates. Now, for the people who uh, need to look at what the, uh, well, yeah, look at what the screen reader is actually reading out loud to you, there is a caption box on the bottom of the screen that reads everything that my screen reader is reading out loud to me right now. Now, you can probably hear from my screen reader, let me just kind of, uh, just go around this interface. Media browser palette, radio group, project timeline, layout area. As you can tell, it's reading pretty fast. So to a screen reader user, this is actually slow. <laughs> this is actually pretty slow for an actual screen reader. This is 75% pitch rate, uh, speech rate. And um, a lot of screen reader users actually use it at 100%, which is way too fast for me. So in, the, uh, in this demonstration, I'm actually going to slow down the speech for the people who actually want to close their eyes and listen to what is going on, feel free. But, also, uh, but if you don't, feel free to look at the caption box and imagine only hearing what's inside that caption box when you're navigating around this interface. So let's slow down my speech here. Great, 75%. 70%. 60%, 55%, So I'm going to put it at 50% because closing rate menu, project timeline, layout area. This is, this is kind of the, uh, the rate for Siri and other voice assistants. Uh, maybe it's a little bit slower, but however, this is mostly what it usually is. So um, to kind of begin, I'm currently on the project timeline, uh, like I'm kind of focused where the project timeline is, but however, I can go around this whole program and hear what's around this whole program. So um, right now I'm gonna be navigating backwards, uh, but before I even begin that, you're gonna realize that the screen reader has no spatial recognition. It's a very, a, a very linear form of navigation Anything that you hear is basically sounding like it's coming uh, very much like in a line form. So you don't know what's on the left-hand side of the screen versus the right-hand side of the screen. So that's why surveys that are like match the icons on the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen. I can't do that with a screen reader. Just uh, It just can't happen because uh, there's just no spatial recognition. So let me just navigate around this uh, in interface and you can kind of get a sense. Media browser palette, radio group. Change the appearance of the clips in the timeline, toggle button, solo, toggle audio waveforms, toggle snapping, group. Timeline navigation forward, dimmed button. Five hours, 19 minutes, and five seconds. Project info. Ira, menu button. Timeline navigation back button. Tool palette, group. Menu button. Override in timeline button, button. Append to timeline button, button. So you kind of append the selected clip to the primaries. You kind of can get a sense of how it's navigating. Um, and as you can tell, a lot of these things are actually reading out loud. You might think, oh, this is a very complicated piece of software. It's an editing piece of software. It's very visual. How can it be accessible? Well, to people who are not using a screen reader, who are just using a keyboard, if you want to get to the browser menu, organizer film strip view group, library, five dot cut what they call the organizer menu, um, there's a keyboard shortcut for that. If you want to get to the timeline, project timeline, layout area, timeline, there's a keyboard shortcut for that. If you want to, let's just interact with this. Zero hours. One. If you want to scrub forward, playhead, value in, or back, there's an app 
I mean, there's a keyboard shortcut for that, which is amazing because then you can use these pieces of software with just your keyboard. And even for sighted individuals, this really helps them in editing faster. So that's why it's so important to actually have these things built in. Now, with that being said, Apple went above and beyond and they actually made a lot of parts of this program really accessible. So as you can tell from here, there's only one specific clip because I actually uh, combined all the clips into one. It's called a compound clip in uh, Final Cut Pro. But if you listen to what it actually reads, so when I interacted with the timeline view, it reads- the zero, zero hours, one minute and 13 seconds, zero, zero, playhead, value indicator. It reads where the playhead is first. Then it reads, uh, if I move on- Zero hours, zero minutes, and zero seconds, zero, zero, app clip, error clip, layout item. As you can tell, it's reading this clip that's in the timeline. Now, you might think, oh, there's only one clip. That's pretty easy to read. Well, let's go into this clip because this is actually a combined clip. So let's uh, let's go into this clip and see how it navigates. Menu bar, editor, mark, clip, modify, clip, clip, menu, create story, synchronize, reference, new, open clip. Open clip. So now we have the clip opened. Zero hours, zero hours, zero minutes, and zero seconds, zero, zero. Gap, gap, layout item. Con, 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 zero hours, one minute. Let's just start from the top where the playhead is. So, playhead, value. As you can tell from this, actually, let me uh, make sure that this fills the whole screen. So you, Zoom to fit. So you can see the whole timeline. Okay, so you're gonna see that the screen reader re reads from left to right, and then from top to bottom just kind of like how you're reading a textbook. So if you listen to what it's gonna read first, it's gonna read the- Container, storyline, group. The containers first, which are the titles of the, uh, of the video. If it goes to the next Busy, one. container, oh, story, there. container, storyline, group. Zero hours, zero minutes, and zero seconds, zero, zero. Gap, gap, layout item. As you can tell, it went to the bottom row now. Zero hours, zero minutes, and one second, zero, zero. Transition, cross dissolve, layout item. Zero hours, zero minutes, and one second, zero, zero. App clip, MVI underscore 4276, layout item. Now I understand that that wasn't a really good uh, way to identify my clips, my bad. <laughs> I, um, uh, as you can tell, some of these actually have names on them, some of them don't. The ones that don't usually are the ones that I just have B-roll, whereas the ones that do, I had to sync the audio with the video. So that's why I created a compound clip and named it such. Like uh, if you listen- to Zero hours, zero hours, zero minutes, and 16 seconds, 18. App clip, MVI underscore four thousand zero hours, zero minutes, and 23 seconds, zero seven. App clip, MVI underscore four zero hours, zero minutes, and 26 seconds, 21. App clip, interview take one, layout item. So right there, there's, uh, it tells you what that clip is. So of course, this is very important to actually label your clips and I am not good at that <laughs> in this project. So um, that's a kind of like an idea of how this complicated of a piece of software can be accessible. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, there's a lot of programs out there that are unfortunately not accessible and not to mention any names, but there's a competitor piece of software that's not accessible at all. It won't read at all. So that's the very unfortunate part of uh, making sure your, uh, not making sure your, ex uh, your program is accessible. So. Now, to move on to something that's a little bit more simpler. Zoom.us, Safari, Safari, CNN, breaking news, latest news and videos, window, CNN, breaking news, latest news and videos, web content has keyboard focus. So we're on CNN's website now, and uh, I'm going to navigate this page exactly like how I navigated the uh, Final Cut Pro with voiceover. So. We're gonna navigate down this page and I'm gonna let you hear how it navigates. So here we go. In CNN, breaking news, latest news and videos, web content, advertisement, frame, advertisement, frame, banner, visited, link, CNN, navigation, link, US, link, world, link, politics, link, business, link, opinion, link, health, link, entertainment, link, style, 
Link. Travel. Link. Sports. Link. Videos. End of navigation. Link. Live story status underscore dark chip live TV. Edition. Button. Search CNN. Button. User account. Button. Open menu. Button. End of banner. Article. Visited. Heading level three. Link. Podcast. The story of late night vertical line. So you kind of get a sense of how it navigates. It navigated the navigation bar and then it went down to the content of the page. Now, if I had to uh, navigate any website like this, it would be really tedious and it will take forever. So the way that screen readers usually navigate to speed it up is we use what we call a links menu and a headings menu. Now, um, I'm probably gonna- be Links menu. Oh, okay. So there's all of these other menus here. There's links, there's headings, there's form controls, but however, the very common ones to navigate are links and headings menu. a headings menu. Now, headings are what's on the page right now, like how the page is laid out. Now, this is why it's very important to actually have heading levels on your page. They should be all, all, there should always be a heading level one at the top where the title is of the page. Uh, like, it, like in this case, it should be the, uh, it should be like homepage or something that should be the heading level one. But as you can tell right here, these are heading level threes. So there's not even a first heading on the page. But with that being said, having these headings, it allowed me, it allows me to jump to a specific part of the page. So if I want to start reading from- Visited, heading level, heading level three, link, capital riot commission, vertical line, heading level three, link, trending, Israel conflict, vertical line. So if I want to start reading from here- Heading level three. I could press enter and it leads me exactly to where that article is. And then I can read- End of article, forwards. article. Heading level three, link, world beta vertical line. So I can read forwards. forwards. Article, end of heading level, article. End of article, heading level three, link, capital riot commission, vertical line. I can read backwards. So that's why it's it's amazing to have this. Now, the next thing that I'm basically gonna be uh, showing you is a links menu here. Headings menu, links menu. So this is a links menu right here. And it's very, very important that your links are actually properly labeled. No click here links, no learn more links, no read more links. Those are really not descriptive. If you wanted to be more descriptive, you could easily make your links say, learn more about such and such topic, read more about this topic, or read the New York Times article, or anything like that. Um, click here's, learn mores, uh, those are very ambiguous of where they're leading. So that's why it's so important to actually um, label your links correctly. So with that being said, this is how the CNN's website navigates. Heading level three. I'm gonna show you one thing that could easily break your navigation. So- Links menu, link, Aclick, link, Aclick. You probably like, oh, what is this? Link, 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 It's Aclick, in the link, ad. Aclick. Exactly. Link, Aclick, link, Aclick, link, Bellroy. Link, so their Bellroy. their images in the in the advertisement don't have alt tags. So I guess they don't want to advertise to people with visual impairments. Is what it, it amounts to. Exactly. And my friend actually even said that why are you pointing out this? We don't want ads on our website. It's okay. Uh, just don't make them uh, put uh, descriptions on them. But that's not a good practice. It's just really not a good practice because now link 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 Bellroy. I'm stuck. I'm stuck inside this frame here out of advertisement Let me frame just, uh, stop interacting so advertise so, advertisement frame this was the first thing on the on the page advertisement frame out of advertisement out of it there we go banner visited link cnn yeah if you remember i uh, you heard that at the beginning Ban ad advertisement frame so if you're inside this advertisement frame in advertise advertisement frame visited heading level three link podcast it lets you jump out of it but if you look at it for a developer links menu Link, Aclick, link, Go in. links menu, no items in, headings menu. There's no headings because it's thinking that you're, because you're focused on the iframe, it's not going to show any of the headings on the page. So if someone's using this menu, it could be very, very frustrating for someone to actually understand where they're at. So that's something that I wanted to point out because 
you could get stuck in here and you don't know how to get out of it. So link, Agilk. Yeah. Um, so we have a question in chat. I just want to let folks know that it's cool to ask your questions in chat. We're going to do a Q&A about this just following this demonstration. And so I'll be reading your, um, I'll be reading your questions and comments then. Yeah, exactly. The next thing I want, uh, the next website I wanted to, uh, to demonstrate is Target's website. Leading advertisement, entering Target, expect more, pay less. So link, skip to main content. First off, as you can hear, they have a skip to main content link if you wanted to skip to the main content. Link, skip to footer. They also have a skip to footer, which is very interesting because usually a lot of websites only have skip to main content. So they kind of went above and beyond on this, but let's listen to how their uh, navigation reads. Navigation, visited, link, home, collapsed, link, categories menu, collapsed, link, deals menu, collapsed, link, what's new menu, Collapsed, link, pickup and delivery menu. Search, suggestions appear below search. Search text field. Trending searches. Link, women's shoes. Replace search term with women's shoes. Same page link button. Link, face mask. Replace search term with face mask. Same page link button. Link, paper towels. Replace search term with link, Apple AirPods. Replace search term link, LOL dolls. Replace search term with LOL clothes. Button, collapsed, link, a link, cart zero items. End of navigation. Your shopping closes at 10 p.m. Balboa collapsed button link registry link weekly ad. So you kind of get a sense of it's actually reading pretty. Uh, it actually reads a little bit better than CNN's because it tells you if it's collapsed or if it's uh, expanded. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you this page is because headings menu. We look at the headings menu. If we wanted to skip that whole navigation bar, we can. We can skip to heading level one. Homepage, heading level one. The homepage, where the content begins. Link, heading level two. Christopher John Rogers for Target. Alexis for Target. Rixo for Target. The new designer dress collection available now. Shop the collection. Replay button. Third party ad content frame. So hey, can you go back to your search and close the search? It's hanging out over the. Re link, link. Yeah. Find store. Link. Gift. Link. 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 Your end of navigate. Link. Cart zero item collapsed. Link. Account menu, close, replace, close. Is it now close? There you go. Yeah, okay. now it's closed. So I, it was Heading reading everything one. on the Home page properly. It was just hard to follow where your cursor was. Okay, but now it's good. Okay, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, so as you can tell. Headings menu. On this headings menu, there's the first heading on the page, which is homepage. And it brings you to the beginning of the content. And as you can tell, I was able to navigate backwards because I knew that the search button was backwards in uh, in the navigation bar. So that's why it's so important to have your first heading because you can jump to it immediately. Heading level one, heading level one. And I wanted to bring this up because if you listen to that advertised frame. Replay, third party ad content frame. Right here, if I interact with it, this and I'm like, oh, I'm, I kind of want to know what's actually uh, advertised here. <laughs> um, in third party ad content frame, link, image. Sponsored, a great match for your morning cuppa, shop velvet breakfast biscuits, link, image, sponsored, a great match for your morning cuppa, shop velvet breakfast biscuits. So as you can tell, it at least reads what that image is. So that's what's amazing about this. So that's basically why I wanted to show you these, because these are two different websites, but one is actually doing a pretty good job. The other one is a little bit more messier, but however, at least it's navigatable. It, um, and I just wanted to kind of get a sense, uh, kind of get you guys a sense of how it navigates. Uh, with that, um, I can show you one more thing, but however, I would like to actually hear questions from you guys. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, I will leave my screen up if you would like me to navigate around to somewhere and uh, answer your questions. We have a question. Um from a little bit earlier, it says, what are your thoughts on links versus buttons? Some links are formatted as buttons, so the buttons use read more or learn more, for example. Um, from the coding perspective, it's neither here nor there whether you have something that displays as a button or whether it just displays as a plain hyperlink. The really important thing is, what is the content in that thing? And how can you make it descriptive? So 
typically you could replace your read more with the title of the document, for example, or the title of the website, for example. I, I feel like there are some places where you just kind of end up with a lot of read more links. Like if you're um, on a newsletter, for example, right? And you have like a title and a little headline um, like blurb, and then you have um, a link to read more, but um, you can just rethink how you structure your content so that you can just hyperlink the title of the article. And then that is in context and is more descriptive than read more. And you can avoid using the, the read more um, or learn more as an example. Jimmy, did you have something that you wanted to share related to that formatting question? Yeah. So links, uh, I get this question a lot, which is how should I put an ARIA label on a link? Well, ARIA labels are mostly meant for buttons. Links are just links. They have a description and that's basically how a link works. With that being said, I completely understand where you're coming from. It's gr it will be great and it will be amazing if you actually put learn more about such and such topic even inside that button because that will allow us to navigate by um, no items in headings man closing uh, headings the, out of target headings menu form controls menu we can navigate by form controls and know exactly what what where that button is so that's why it's very very helpful if that button is labeled correctly so um, that's that's a great question target Oh yeah, somebody actually asked about the ARIA label in the code as well for the buttons. Yeah, so you can add an ARIA label to, to the buttons, but not for the regular links as Jimmy just mentioned. Okay, we've got a couple of comments here I wanna share. The header demonstration is great and can be useful for more than just websites. Headings can be set up for PDFs as well. You can use Adobe Acrobat to set a reading order to make sure things are read in the correct order. Yeah, so this applies to, um, to other documents too. Um, you can do it with a Word document or a Google document or anything when you're in the format menu in what looks like the little WYSIWYG editor. Just look for those headings. Um, some advice about how to break up your content is just think about how you might segment your content and use an outline um, and kind of divide it up that way. And so you would just, just like you wouldn't skip levels in an outline, don't skip levels in your headings. Um, so that is a great point about headings are great for other things besides just websites. Someone and, else says, oh, go ahead, Jimmy. And it's amazing because if you look at even Apple's App Store on their phones, they even have headings. So it's amazing that a lot of these things can be applied to any type of uh, development platform for electronic accessibility. So, sorry, Jen, go ahead. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, thank you for that. Someone says, this demo is really interesting. I've never realized you could get stuck inside an advertising frame. Yeah, me either. I actually didn't realize that until we started um, looking at some examples we were going to use. Someone else said skip to main main content. Cool. Yeah, the skip to main content is really one of my favorite favorite features um, uh, because it's it's just another point. Uh, so if you have more novice users who aren't familiar with like getting to the headings menu or getting to the links menu, then you're still providing them an easy way to to skip to the content. So. Those are the comments that we have, uh, questions we have so far, uh, but I invite you to continue to ask questions if you, if you still have any lingering questions, um, if there's something that you would specifically like Jimmy to show using with the screen reader, um, he can probably do that too. Yeah, and uh, I had a comment, uh, I had a, uh, we had a comment earlier in the chat and you're curious about how the dual page looks. New tab. So we can go quickly to M C M F C M P U C S D P U C S D U C M U C S D dot E D U. Closing menu. Okay. So password. Password. Secure edit text with autofill. I'm gonna just do touch ID. Closing menu. Okay. U C S D S S O. So here's something that you you all are familiar with. So I'm just gonna navigate down this. Link. Skip to main content. Link. Single sign on V three point three. Visited. Link. U C San Diego. 
End of banner. Main. Heading level 3. Authenticate with Duo. Frame 0. Visited. Link. Cancel login request. End of main. Content information. Article. UC San Diego 9500 Gilman DR La Jolla, CA 92093, 858, 534, 2230. End of article. Article. Copyright, copyright sign. 2017. And then so on and so forth. Now, you probably realize that the frame doesn't read as anything. Let's go back up to it again. Cop article. And you article. Con end of visit frame heading level three. Frame zero. It reads as frame zero. The reason why it reads like this is because a lot of people don't know that you actually have to put um, titles inside of iframes when you embed them. And that's why it's so important that uh, a lot of these things you test with someone who uses a screen reader, because of course, someone who's just using voiceover here could easily skip over this. Now, I know that this is a frame that has all the content inside it. And if you look at the headings menu, form controls menu. No items in for headings menu. Right here. Heading level two. Choose an authentication method. It's a heading level two inside that frame. So it's picking it up. But one item. Heading level closing. Let's heading just go to man link. Single sign. So this is outside the frame. Headings menu. Heading level three. Authenticate with duo. Heading level two. Choose an authentication method. If you're stuck in here. Heading level two. Choose an authentic main. Heading level two. Choose an authentic duo push. Recommended. Send me a push button. As you can tell, like these, um, you're stuck in the frame and you're not actually sure if you can get out of it until you actually realize that it's a frame inside of here. So that's something to actually be aware of when you do embed uh, content like this. Make sure your iframes are actually labeled correctly and make sure that you are actually testing with accessibility in mind. So that's what I wanted to show you guys. We Main. have a question. Somebody's asking if it would be possible for you to navigate to the ucsd.edu and just tell us what you think about how that's set up. All right. Yeah, we can do that. Um, Open location. So here we go. CFDPDU, ucsd.edu, University of California, San Diego, web content. University of California, universe, skip COVID-19, skip to the main content. Button, navigation. COVID-19 updates. Information and resources are available for the campus community on the link. Return to learn website. Please stay up to date with county and state guidelines as well as link. CDC recommendations. Period. Visited. Link. Learn more. Visited. Link. 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 A to Z site index. Link. Image. Navigate back to home. Search box. Search. Search icon. But link. Give. Submit. Button. End of. Search box. Visited. Link. About. Visited. Link. Visiting and tour. Visited. Link. History. Link. News. Link. Jobs at UC San Diego. Link. Office of the Chancellor. Link. UC San Diego Health. Link. Economic Impact Report. Visited. Link. Academics. Link. Trigon Link. Visited. Link. Undergraduate Degrees. Link. Graduate Degrees and Programs. So as you can tell, the reason why I wasn't speaking at any of these points is because I wanted you guys to hear how it feels to actually navigate through this menu. As you can tell, it's it seems like it's an everlasting menu. It doesn't say it's collapsed and it doesn't say that it's expanded. So that's why it's so important to actually uh, make your menu more accessible because that makes it so much easier to navigate. Now let's go into the links menu here. Headings menu, links menu. So as you can tell, it's I think the third link in. Link, return to learn link. CDC recommendation visited link. Learn more. As you can tell, learn more could easily be very confusing because luckily voiceover brings your focus to where the learn more button is so you can read around it. But other screen readers like JAWS or NVDA, very popular screen readers on Windows, what they do is- Visit it. They go directly- Expand it. Return to learn. They go directly to this page and now you're not on the UC San Diego homepage anymore. So that's why it's so important to have uh, properly labeled links because that learn more just led me to a different page that I'm not really sure where it is. So that's why it's so important. And I understand that that's a banner. It's not really a part of the UC San Diego homepage, but just wanted to point that out. Back. COVID not COVID now, not links menu, headings menu. You look at the headings menu. There is a heading level one on the page. Heading level one, remembering Chancellor Emerita Fox, two of four. Heading level one, 
We but if you listen closely, UC San Diego mourns the passing of Chancellor Emerita Marianne Fox. Fox served as UC San Diego's seventh chancellor and was the first woman to be permanently appointed to the role. We express learn more about Marianne Fox. Button for learn more about Marianne Fox. Button. So I'm actually stuck inside this because this is actually a list box. So let me stop interacting with this list box. As you can tell, end of navigation list box. It just reads as list box. It would be great if this was, of course, labeled as rotating banners or revolving banners list box or something like that that's a little bit more descriptive because, of course, you don't know what this list box is. Heading level three. Notice on Excelion data brief. And then when we go into headings menu. menu again, as you can tell, these actually skip through. So there's a heading level one, then it skips to a heading level three, then to a heading level two. So what I usually suggest to people is to outline your page. Like what Jen said earlier, you don't skip Roman numerals or you don't skip from an uppercase A to, uh, you don't skip to a lowercase A if you've never done an uppercase A on your outlines. So that's why it's always great to actually outline your page. Then you know exactly where, what should be what, so. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. We have a couple of other questions. Heading level so three. One question we have is what's the difference between visited link and link? So I can um, answer that really quick. So as a, as a sighted user, if you're looking at a page and you have visited a link, right, it might be purple instead of blue. It's just an indicator that you've already been to that link. So um, essentially, uh, the screen reader is just letting the user know, oh, you've been to this link before, so it's been visited, right? So if, if, if Jimmy started with a fresh thing and he had no cookies and no cash, like he hadn't been anywhere, then none of those links would say visited. They would just say link as in a, a, an identifier. So someone else is asking uh, links, target a new window or in the same window, what do people who are using screen readers prefer? Do you have thoughts on that, Jimmy? Oh, like links target to, oh. Um, I think it's very common practice to actually have it in the same window. Usually when you open something, it usually becomes in, uh, into a same window. However, sometimes I understand that um, like content management systems, uh, when you create your websites and anything like that, they will uh, force you to actually open the tab into, a, uh, open the link into a new window. So what I usually suggest is on the link, uh, there's a difference. There's a description, which is exactly what the screen reader is reading. And there's also a link title. The link title is usually where people put link opens in the new window, and then the screen reader will read that. So that's what, uh, that's what the usual title attribute usually does. Um, but however, long story short, I usually prefer if it just stays in one window, because if you want to go back, you can. If you, uh, say for example, want to go forward, you can. So you get the choice to actually go uh, browse anywhere that you want. Yeah, from the general development perspective, I would say that that is the same answer that I would provide. Um, open links where you can in the same window and then let the user choose, right? Because there's a keyboard shortcut to open things in a new tab. Um, there's a right-click context menu to open things in a new tab. So, um, so the user has a little bit more choice over what they wanna do if you just leave it with the standard behavior, which is opening in the same window. Someone is asking, what screen reader is Jimmy using here? I'm using uh, VoiceOver, which is built into the Mac operating system. It's built into actually every Apple operating system, uh, from the iPhone to the Apple TV, to the iPad, to the Mac. So I'm using VoiceOver, and this browser that I'm using is Safari. Uh, there's also very popular pieces of uh, uh, screen readers. Uh, one is JAWS for Windows. Uh, that, that is made by Freedom Scientific. And there's also another one that's free uh, is called NVDA. And th that's uh, also a Windows screen reader. The reason why Macs don't really have other screen readers is because VoiceOver is so good. <laughs> and usually what happens is when you test with a screen reader in any uh, platform, it usually allows you to recognize if it actually does read. 
because the voiceover screen reader works really similarly to what the window screen reader does. In fact, sometimes voiceover has more features than a window screen reader. So that's why I prefer to use voiceover on Mac. Okay, hey, we have another question here. It's not specifically screen reader related, but it's a great question. Can you share some insights on how to create accessible PDFs and other documents that are frequently placed online? So basically, if you, um, if you usually when you create a PDF, you're creating a PDF from a source document. So you might be starting with a Word document or a Google document or a PowerPoint slide or something like that, right? So if you follow the principle, like the general principles of using headings to break up your content um, and using descriptive hyperlinks and describing your images, which we're gonna talk about next, um, then when you export your document to PDF, it, it will carry over all of those attributes and essentially make your PDF be accessible. Um, and on the PDF related to that note, the campus has a tool called Site Improve, which is a tool available for basically automated accessibility monitoring. And one of the features that the Site Improve tool has that other tools like it don't seem to have is it will actually scan the contents of PDFs that are on the site and tell you if there are accessibility issues or broken links within the PDF. So um, if you, um, there is a blank page on, um, on Site Improve. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can just put Site Improve in the search on Blink and it'll pull it right up for you. Someone, oh, okay, here's another, um, here's another question. For the coronavirus disclaimer at the top of the UCSD homepage, can you give an example of alternate text that would be a, more appropriate for the Learn More link? Uh, a very good one could be learn more about Return to Learn or learn more, yeah. Learn more about returning to campus or something on those lines, something that tells you where that link is leading to. Great question, though, because. Yeah, so you see, it's really subjective to there's not necessarily like one and only single source of right answer. Like some of it is, um, you know, going to be based on the context of the content around you. So this seems like this might be a good time to transition into our cut pro. Zoom. Us. Zoom. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to load uh, back up my slideshow and we'll continue. And I just want to share what somebody said as a recommendation for, um, for that leak text. Someone recommended visit the return to campus plan. So that is a great example of a very descriptive link. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you for sharing that. Okay, I'm just going to get back to my slide deck here and we will go through um, just some quick exercises, um, context around um, describing images. So yeah, um, back, back to my Zoom window, got my, okay, so. So. I am on the screen for describing images and Jimmy is gonna start for the first part of this. Yeah, thank you. So tips to actually describe your images. Basically, what I always tell people is to keep it as short and convey the descriptive context as best as possible. By, that, by this, I mean, keep it as short and the way to actually find out if it's way too long, a good practice is to read it out loud to yourself. If you already feel bored at the end of your description, the screen reader user would not want to sit through that as well. So what I usually suggest is if your description is that long, then is it, if there's a lot of content inside the image, break it out of the image, break the text outside of the image, because that makes it better for all people. If you are on a mobile device and you want to zoom into that image, it will become more pixelated at the more you zoom in. So therefore breaking the content out and putting into the body of your website or post will allow you 
to uh, make that image more descriptive and better. Um, so definitely keep it as short and precise as possible. And there's no need to include photo of or image of in your description because my screen reader actually does read image at the end. So it, it knows that it's an image. So the only thing you have to do is just to describe the important key elements of the image. And that's why it's so important to actually describe these, but you don't have to put photo of or image of. Now, descriptions may vary depending on the specific content that you are, uh, write, uh, that you are writing these for. So there's two, there's these images on the bottom of the screen, uh, or I think it's at the bottom of the screen uh, that yep. I would like at the I bottom. Like Jen to, yeah, I would like to, Jen, I would like Jen to uh, describe these and uh, she will also lead us through the um, exercises after these. So um, take it away, Jen. So we have two different images and they look identical. It's a, a woman, um, and uh, she's like on a, on a scenic overlook basically. Um, and so you can see like a, from a far view of the city, right? So if we're, um, if we're looking at this image and um, maybe we're writing some content about travel, um, then our alt text for that image might be something like woman overlooking city from afar. So um, you, yeah, it just needs to be, like you don't have to describe literally every element in the image like um in terms of like what she's wearing or or what her hair is unless that's relevant to your to your content to your content or your context right so if we had that same image right and we're writing an article about air pollution then our alt text might be something like woman overlooking a smoggy city and so um this is where like um, descriptions may vary, um, so you can be pretty general, except where you need to like tie it back into your content. You don't have to get into the nitty gritty details of every single thing that's in your image. It's overwhelming. Um, try not to overthink it when you're describing images. So that, that's a pretty good tip is just kind of um, just very general. Um, not too detail oriented. While we're on the subject of images, and Jimmy kind of mentioned this when he was um, introducing the, the content, is um, if you have an image with a lot of text in it, in the image, that is, that is not recommended. You want to have basically a very minimal amount of text in an image because any text in the image should be presented in the alt text. And if the alt gets too long, then the end user is going to miss some content. So if you find yourself um, like where well, you have an image that has some text in it and you're reading that out to yourself and you're like, man, this is too long, you can take <clears throat> you can take some of the content out of the image and just put it in plain text and just leave the simpler part of it in the alt, in, in the image and then just describe that in the alt text. So it's not like you can never use um, text in an image. It's just to try to keep that as minimal as possible. And really uh, the things that we're talking about in terms of describing our, um, describing our hyperlinks, being descriptive about how we write those, um, describing our images and how we think about how we write those descriptions like all of those types of things, not only do they help people who are might be using assistive technology, but they also help everyone. Um, and they help us meet our goals as like digital marketers as well, because engaging in these practices um, consistently will actually help you improve the search engine optimization of your website and make it easier for people to find the content that you want them to find. So on the next screen, um, I'm just going to switch to this tab. Basically, this is the part where we're going to get into a little bit of practice um, describing these images. And I want to give a shout out to my colleagues in the library for basically letting me reuse some content that we used in a, a recent training that we had. So I'm, I'm glad I didn't have to reinvent the wheel for this. So I'll just. Uh, go through a brief description of what we have here, and then you can feel free to, um, to post uh, in the chat and I'll be sharing those out with the group. Um, 
to, to let folks know uh, some of the ideas we got. So the first context is for a crafter's lunch. The second context is a potluck sign up. And the third context is a summer picnic. And the three images are basically like a, like a blank slate with some art materials. We have a picture of a carrot cake and we have a picture of some bright balloons. And so, uh, yeah, just feel free to, to post in the chat what you think about um, how you might uh, describe these images and, and you can be creative. And again, there's way more than one right answer for these types of things. So we got one, we got one, uh, we got one comment about our context one, and uh, the person says, "Attend the crafters lunch on June thirtieth at three p.m." Sounds like a pretty, pretty useful um, alternate text, especially if we could imagine that inside that blank space there's a date and a time uh, for someone to RSVP. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's great creativity thinking about how how we might. How we might describe that that first image that we see on the screen. Does anyone else have any ideas that they would like to share about how we might caption any of those images? That's a great point, actually. In fact, uh, yesterday we were running into, I think it was yesterday, that we ran into a specific thing where um, the image actually didn't say, win an M Amazon gift card. Therefore, I didn't know, as the screen reader user, I didn't know that uh, the contest was to win an Amazon gift card. I knew it was a contest, but I didn't know what was at stake. So that was a great uh, example right there. Oh yeah, we were, we were reviewing a, a page on the, uh, on, the, on the library website incidentally, and, and the alt tag was, was very well done for, except for it dropped that key piece of text. And, we were kind of, um, we were talking about, yeah, wouldn't it have been nice to know that that was, there was a contest there for, for something that, you know, pretty much everybody would want some of, right? Like we can all use more Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, just that's again, just make sure if you're putting text in your, um, in text in your image, make sure you, that text is in your alt tag. And if you don't put it in your alt tag, then just make sure the text is in plain text somewhere below the, um, you know, below the image itself. Um, okay, so we have some more, um, we have some more descriptions here. So someone says, cheery celebratory balloons. I love that description. The balloon picture is my favorite anyway, just all the colors are really fun. Um, someone says for number two, sign up to bring a dish to the potluck. That is a great description as well. Um, so, oh, we have, uh, someone has feedback on all three. So we have, um, uh, first description is a blank sheet of paper with art supplies around it. And that is very descriptive and that is exactly what it is. Um, and so that is a perfectly appropriate alt tag and it's very succinct and it's definitely descriptive enough to give a user who can't see that content, the right idea about the content. Exactly. Uh, the second description uh, this person has is cake with frosting drizzling off the sides. And I love that you added the detail about the drizzle um, because it does give a little bit more, um, you know, something for people to imagine in their mind about what that might look like. And, and, and the third description this person shared is a pile of different size balloons. So, so again, we see like, okay, we have a couple different ways that we describe the balloons and they're both bright. Um, and there's probably a, a half a dozen more uh, ways to describe those. Um, so someone is asking a question, um, is it better to describe what the image is of or, 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 or describe like the event. I think that it depends on your adjacent content. So I think that it could be it could be both. You could describe what the image is or describe the the event. So especially for that first image, you might actually have 
the event details inside of that image. Um, and so in that case, your alt text might change based on that. Um, if we were using this something as just like a decorative accent, then describing what's in the image as opposed to what the event is, is appropriate. So someone else um, shared uh, another description for for our summer picnic, uh, and they say several pastel colored balloons. So that is um, that is great feedback there as well. Yes. So we have a couple more minutes left. So I want to thank you all um, for participating in this little exercise. We just have a couple of more slides to share with you before we conclude the event. We want to make sure that we, we don't have to rush any of that. So I am going to proceed to the next slide and I will pass it back over to Jimmy um, to talk about where we might add our image descriptions. Thank you, Jen. So the most important ones, and you all actually come into a contact with these, are social media posts, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, etc. A great example is when I was in school, um, a lot of the posters that my, uh, you know, my uh, friends post on their uh, timelines, I can't read. So I would be missing all that content. So that's why it's so important to actually describe these. And this is a really good practice because then you get, you get this practice and then you can apply it to uh, your future websites and future content like, um, like uh, documents or uh, like Word docs and also PowerPoint presentations. Now, in terms of websites to go, kind of go back into that, uh, like what Jen says, it really does improve your search engine optimization because the computer reads the description rather than reading img underscore 045.jpg. Uh, of course, one is way much more descriptive than the other. So therefore it's so important to actually have these labeled correctly. So to uh, kind of talk about where you can find these uh, features. I would uh, like uh, Jen to uh, talk about where you can find them. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. So yeah, when so where you might find the place to add the um, description for the text, it might be located in a different area um, depending on what system you're using. So, so like if you're using the campus uh, CMS or you're using a WordPress or, you know, it's even kind of a little bit different um, um, between like Facebook and Instagram. I was kind of looking at the details of like how to do that. So um, typically what you're gonna look for is something that, set, that is labeled as description. So in the campus CMS, it's labeled as description. I've seen it a few other areas. Um, that is where you actually are gonna add the alt text. In some systems and even on um, Facebook and Instagram, it's actually labeled as alt text. Um, of course, if you're actually um, coding um, HTML by hand, then we refer to it as alt text there as well. Um, a quick note about um, adding alt text specifically on um, Instagram and Facebook is you might have to um, look for, um, when you're adding an image to Facebook, look for the edit button. The edit button actually allows you to go in um, and uh, per, put, a, put an alt tag on the image. It looks like Facebook has some, some smart technology now where it's trying to like guess and automatically generate um, alternate text for the image. So like you can look at that and say, oh, that's sufficient enough and just choose that. Or you can toggle the box and write your own description. Um, in Instagram, when you're um, uploading an image, it looks like you need to click on advanced and then and when you go into advanced, there's a field for all um, for alt text. So, so when we talk about labeling our images, it's really important to think about, we're not just talking about on the web here, we're talking about on the web everywhere, and your reach really, like memes should be for everybody, right? But how many memes are people with visual impairments missing out on because it just says, image um, and doesn't translate any of the uh, text or other activity that might be um, super hilarious or uh, you know otherwise engaging uh, for for that particular audience. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, basically this is the conclusion of our content. And so, oh no, I'm stuck again. Okay, there we go. I got unstuck. Okay, so the last um, the last thing we wanted to share is just the contact information and uh, um, some resources to learn more. So I have my my name and email on the screen. Um, so my email is jdandel at ucsd.edu and Jimmy, Jimmy's email is c2kong at ucsd.edu. I have a um, link in the deck too. Also, I shared it in the chat earlier to accessibility.ucsd.edu. So there's some resources that folks can use there to learn more about access accessibility or feel free to reach out to the members of the Electronic Accessibility Oversight Committee and we can um, help you with your um, making things more accessible there as well. And then uh, the final link is the disability resources at UC San Diego. So this is disabilities.ucsd.edu. So the pathways are a little bit different depending on whether you're a faculty or staff or whether you're a student. But if you hit that main portal, then you'll pretty much get to the whole um, the whole broad set of information. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here and uh, for participating in the conversation. We very much uh, appreciated the opportunity to spend this time with you. Do you have anything you want to share before we go, Jimmy? Oh, last slide here, just put up on the screen. So this is uh, this is Jimmy and I having a little bit of fun. So I'm skateboarding and Jimmy is DJing. And uh, so we just wanted to share that with you uh, just so you could see a little bit about uh, who we are outside of our work context. So uh, thank you all again so much for being here and feel free to reach out to us um, if you wanna continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Shen. And it is, it is really, uh, uh, it's, it's really, I'm really glad that you all attended this meeting. And uh, if you ever need any assistance or anything like that, always feel free to reach out.